end of the uh, course, and uh, we will quickly run through what we did yesterday, maybe in a couple of minutes, and then we will move on to the next unit. To to begin with, we had a we we discussed about about why. Uh, spoken english what is spoken english why spoken english is necessary and how we can uh, improve improve spoken english and uh, i was impressed with the responses of the participants my colleagues many of whom uh, kept on uh, asking or suggesting or giving their opinions and all those so it was an enriching experience yesterday and hope to have the same thing today as well uh, today being the second day and the last uh, session of the, of the course, we, we will try to uh, cover the entire uh, module by the, uh, by the end of the uh, class, say let's about one and a half hours from now. We, uh, when when we, we discuss the uh, sound system, so uh, if, if, you, if you can recall, uh, there are there are 26 letters in the English alphabet and 44 uh, sounds. Now each of those sounds uh, is unique because if we replace one sound with another, that will lead to a result in another word, which means that that sound is unique. Uh, we also we also discussed the uh, silent letters and and uh, uh, no that that then we divided that into vowels and consonants and. And there are 24 consonants and 20 vowels. Those 20 vowels again can are sub are subdivided into two pure vowels or monophthongs, 12 of them, and eight diphthongs. Diphthongs are those which are uh, made up of two sounds used as one unit or one sound. And there are 24 consonants, and that's how they make it for 24. And then we also we also discuss the, uh, the syllables uh, in in English. Uh, syllables, as as all of us are aware, are the smallest units next in hierarchy to phonemes. Those are phonemes that uh, each sound is a phoneme, and syllables are higher than a phoneme and less than or lower than a word. In fact, uh, syllables make up or constitute words. Some syllables group together to form a word. So, uh, example, we can we can take an example: table, for instance, or television, or computer. Computer three, television, television, or pencil. So that's how those are syllables. Uh, and uh, there are uh, words can be made up of a uh, single syllable or uh, more than one syllable, two or more syllables. Uh, those words which are made up of one one syllable or single syllable, they are called monosyllabic words, like I, for instance. Uh, I is a monosyllabic word. This I also, I is also monosyllabic word. Uh, then uh, aim is a, is a monosyllabic word, aim, aim for the goal. Then there are polysyllabic words, which are made up of two or more syllables. They, they, can, have, they can have two or uh, up to five, six, depending on the word size. Uh, but then, but then we can we can break the break down that word into syllables and then put a put a hyphen. Hyphens are put between syllables to yarma to make a di distinction between syllables. Uh, like like a sound, a phonemic sound or a phonetic sound is is put between slash two slashes, and that gives us the uh, that tells us that this sound or per ka that's an independent sound and. That that sound uh, that's a phoneme uh, or a sound or a speech sound. So, so those are those sounds. Each of the sounds is put between. There are two slashes, one one before, one after, and that's a sound. Similarly, for syllable break, we use hyphens in between, and then that, that gives us the uh, idea. That gives us the information that this word has these many syllables, two or three or five or whatever. Uh, the the optimal structure uh, we can have in English with regard to the syllable or syllabification is C C C V C C C C where C is for consonant, V is for vowel. There has to be a vowel 
although we have also some words which are uh, which can be made up of only consonants or only vowels but then we have to have have one verb at least one vowel at least and then we can have consonants uh, up to three before and up to four after uh, and those those con those words which are made up of only uh, consonants those are very rare and we we don't use them in our day-to-day -day life uh, on the on the contrary uh, a word in English any any word in English any any standard word or that word we use in our day-to-day -day life is made up of at least one vowel and then there can be one or more consonants and and the the structure uh, of the of the syllable uh, a few examples I can give you off the cuff uh, let's say uh, only vowel is I or A or O so all those are only made up of, made up of only one vowel sound. There, there can be B, C, one vowel, one consonant, so something like uh, at, uh, it looked at me, or up. So up is a, is a sound again, a is a vowel, and P is a consonant. Similarly, one vowel and two consonants, B, C, C. So something like uh, it's ITS. So E is a, is a vowel sound, and T and so are, are uh, consonants. So ifs also will be ifs and buts. So ifs also will be, will fall under this category. Then we can have a consonant and a vowel, consonant followed by a vowel. So something like uh, T, uh, or she, or go. There again, one vowel, one consonant, go. Go is a vowel, consonant, and O. Then uh, one, one consonant, one vowel, one consonant again, something like boat. Or one consonant, one vowel and two consonants. That's like box. Or one consonant, one vowel, and three consonants. Something like tempt, tempting, tempt. Or one, one consonant, one vowel, and three, four consonants, followed by four consonants. Something like texts, texts, T-E-X-T-S. So T is one consonant, A is, is one vowel, and then K, S, T, S, text. So those are four consonants, and this is how we can have similarly we have we can have three consonants one vowel uh, something like straw or spray or two consonants one vowel and one consonant would be in something like praise or two consonants and one vowel uh, something like snow or three consonants one vowel and one consonant would be in splash water in splash water or me so those are syllables now coming to uh, supra segmentals, there are there are features. There are a uh, lot many features in language in any language, and more particularly in English, which uh, may not be as necessary for for uh, using it for informal use, but for formal speech, for using uh, for using English in formal speech, we need some uh, some other features like supra segmental features. They also come to play. They make it uh, easy. They make it. They add some flavor to English, to our English. They they add a fluency uh, and accuracy to the language we use, and that's how uh, it it gets some more weight. So uh, supra segment does basically refers to or means uh, the prosodic features, which uh, which are which are like speech features. Let's say uh, something like stress tone or word juncture between two words when we transit from one word to another in the same phrase at the same breath we transit and that in order to make that smooth we use a juncture so that's a those are word junctures and uh, syllables are, are also syllabification silent letters and all those features get added to this and then they make our uh, make our speech or or uh, english fluent and sound better. Uh, these, these features are not limited to single sounds. They are, in fact, uh, they extend to syllables, words, phrases. Syllables, as I told you, is the smallest unit. Syllable is the smallest unit, so up, upward then. So syllable and then word and then phrase and then clause and then sentences. And then those sentences will run into paragraphs. So when we use them in, in context, we do not limit ourselves only to words or phrases. We use them in sentences also because we 
we in informal speeches on most occasions we use complete sentences and therefore these features become all the more necessary in in speech when we speak uh, uh, somewhere in speech supra segmental feature they refer to this phonological property of of more than one sound segment now from phonological property when we say phonological property so how we pronounce each word each sound and those sounds cumulatively cumulatively produce a word and then we have stress and then from one sound to another from one word to another we transit or we smoothly move into the next sound next word so that it 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 doesn't become a, a bouncy affair okay uh supra segmental features are uh, which means the supra segmental features are uh, speech attributes all those features of speech uh, and the patterns they are speech attributes and they have a pattern stress syllable on stress syllables and then accent and rhythm and then pitch and then contour and and then the loudness or the or the level of of tone Uh, and the pace all those all those features uh involve all those features help us in in uh our speech uh it in fact in fact supra segmental features also add uh, meter and rhythm to the to the poem it also adds structure and cadence to the to, to a poem in case we are re- reciting in case we are reciting all right now uh next coming to the consonant cluster consonant cluster is also an important segment an important part of a of of a spoken english because they they this the cluster together they group together some sounds group together since we are talking of consonant cluster so only consonants consonants group together to form as one unit let's say in a word like please or play so p p, p and l now that's a cluster we we do not separate them we do not we do not use them independently or separately so pl is used as one unit and in a word like play so that per and la it it gives us a a, a, a cluster play or or uh, a cure k and u so k and u u sound k sound and u sound that gives us a word like cure so that's again another another example of a consonant cluster or or a uh, swim as w i m swim or swine so s w there again that's a that's a cluster consonant cluster or uh, something like human h u human h n y a y a sound as in yell as in yolk as in uh, york as as in uh, yet so that that y and h so any other that together gives us a word like human and that's again is a consonant cluster so consonant cluster is basically uh, is a is a sequence or a or a compound a consonant compound because it's made up of two or more consonant sounds or consonant consonants so when two or more group together to form as one unit that's that's uh, when we call it a compound compound because they are made up of two or more things compound and it's a group or sequence of consonants that appear together in a syllable without any vowel in between them if there's a vowel in between let's say let's say p n uh, l please or p n r pray if if there's a vowel in between then it won't be it won't be a consonant it won't be a consonant cluster it will be let's say p l uh, in a word like play let's say something like p i e l ly so now that becomes p l a then so that won't be a consonant cluster right okay there are there are several types of clusters consonant clusters initial cl- cluster and final clusters in the in the initial clusters in the uh, when we use the initial clusters uh, initial clusters also we can have two and three and all those so initial cluster uh three initial clusters two for instance we have this please and and uh train and then duty and and uh, glue and uh, spin and music initial clusters two three so three three sounds put together will will make it uh, the cluster at the 
initial level. Now, what, what happens there is <laughs> when we use these three sounds together, three consonants together, they give us in, initially in the first half of the word, not in the second part of the word. So something like splash, SPL or scrap, circa and raw, or, or split, C, S, serpa and law. So they, they give us one, one word split or spray or splash or, or a scrap or student. So that's how that's initial cluster three. There are final now, which, come, which comes at the end of the word, second part of the word, final part of the word. And uh, the, those again can have two, three, four. So final clusters two, for example, we can have something like bulb, B-U-L-B, bulb. So that's last part, lo and ba, that's a consonant, final consonant cluster with two, two, two clusters. Similarly, uh, in a word like, let's say, uh, let's say bold, B-O-L-D, bold. Lo and da, that's again, is the final cluster with two sounds. Similarly, uh, the and ja, for instance, pulls. So he pulled, he pulls it uh, hard. So P-U-L-L-S or, or bulls. So that's again, that's again, that's because that's a sound which is made up of two, la and ja. So that's again, final cluster two. Now, final clusters three, you can have something like text. So, curse or enter three. These are final. Or or uh, something like helps. La, pa, and sa, three sounds. La, pa, sa, so helps. Or depths, D, E, P, T, H, S. Per, tha, and sa. So, that's, that's, those are consonant clusters three, final clusters three. Then there are four. We can have four also in the final clusters, uh, four elements in the final clusters uh, in examples like, like sixths, S-I-X-T-H-S, sixths. So that five sixths of the, of the population, uh, something like this. So five sixths of the population. So five by six, that, that makes it five sixths. That becomes the, the uh, six becomes the plural, becomes the plural. So S I X T T T H S sixth. <coughs> All right. One more, one more important criterion, one more important aspect, which also uh, makes our uh, English comfortable, makes us helps our English uh, or a, a, adds fluency to our English, is the weak form. Now, in the in our attempt. To, to speak. Now, there are there are so many parameters we use either deliberately or naturally. It can be, it can happen in two ways. One is initially when we learn a language, when we pick up a language, when we pick up a skill, it maybe we make attempts to learn that and then do that and put it to use. So there maybe we, we put it to practice and then you try using it. Subsequently, over a period of time, it becomes spontaneous. It, it comes almost automatically. Yeah. It's like it's 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 like uh, this. All of us acquire our mother tongues, whatever mother tongue. It may be Bengali, it may be Odia, it may be uh, Telugu, it may be Tamil. Whatever mother tongue that we use, we acquire it. We don't learn it. We acquire it. As a, as a small baby, we are exposed to so many. Uh, to, to, to the language from so many sides, from so many corners, that it, it almost uh, gets embedded to our DNA. Nobody teaches us uh, as a small kid that this is what is called, uh, or water is called something like Pani. Pani is called uh, water in Hindi. Uh, or, or Pani is, is, is water. Or, or Ma is mother. Or uh, Something, something. So, fool, fool is a flower. Now, nobody teaches us that one. We we observe, we see people, we see mom, dad, our grandparents, or uh, domestic help, or people around us in in the community. Uh, we see people behave. We see people talk to them, talk to each other, talk to us, and that's how it gets reinforced in our memory. And then we know that we find a pattern that okay. So whenever. I need water, I must tell Pani. 
Now that I I see over a period of time that that mom gets me water whenever I I uh, or, or milk milk for instance okay as a small baby milk whenever I am hungry so I know that that's food that's a type of food that gives me that gives me strength that saves me from hunger and and that's how whenever I I feel hungry all I need to do is to maybe identify is to show a finger is to is to say is to shout it out. So food or or khana or something like that, and that's how we learn. So that's that's acquisition. But mother, other tongue is this is that was mother tongue. Other tongue means any language that we learn other than the tongue that we are born with. Those those we we'll, we we'll make a conscious effort to learn. So okay, we 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 actually uh, attempt to learn uh, from the basic, from the alphabet and onwards, and then how to write, how to speak, how to read. Hey, listen to people, then uh, rep- repetition, then homework, then assignment, then exercises, tasks, all those things that happen, and that's a formal learning. So in this case, also when we when we le- when we speak English, initially it looks like we are learning, we are putting a lot of effort, we are we are making a conscious attempt to learn something, but gradually over a period of time, it becomes a part of our life because because everywhere we keep using this, and therefore. It it becomes a, a a part of the uh, language that we uh, part of our communication process. So then we start using it, and it becomes almost natural. Over a period of time, initially we might fumble, we might uh, stumble, but once once we feel comfortable, once we feel confident, two things in fact: one is comfortable, second one is confident. Once we feel confident that okay, I can speak, I I don't mind speaking. Uh, I I don't think anybody. Uh, uh, I I don't think that uh, I will uh, fall prey to uh, something like people's uh, laughter or, or whatever. People will laugh at me. I am I'm not scared of that. Once I gain that confidence, then I start speaking, and that's how that's how it becomes a natural uh, natural uh, process. And and so from the process of learning, now it becomes spontaneous. So whenever there's a, there's an occasion, we, we speak and. Those that pace and then pitch and the and the modulation of voice and the accent at at proper uh, places and the right pitch and and the uh, intonation and and pronunciation pronouncing each sound clearly uh, with with whatever loudness that we need whatever pace that is necessary for that context context we, we it becomes a part of us so that we don't have to. We don't have to see and follow everything. Okay, I'm talking to my teacher, and therefore I need to use this tone. When I'm talking to my servant, I am I must use this tone. We don't pick up a book and then refer to the notebook or the or the dictionary to see that. It it happens automatically. It happens almost as if it is is done spontaneously. So weak forms are one of them. Weak forms. Uh, there are a number of words in English which have two or more qualitative and quantitative patterns. Two things, in terms of quality and in terms of quantity, patterns depending upon whether they are accented or not. If they are accented, that's they they will have a different use. If they are unaccented, they will have a different rule. They will use different rules. When those words are accented, when the words which are accented, and the strong forms of these words are used, we will use strong forms in the accented. Words in the stressed words, and in case of the unaccented uh, words or unstressed words, we use the weak forms. Now, weak forms. What what are they? Weak forms exhibit reduction of length of sounds. So those sounds, the length of the sounds are reduced. Is reduced. If it takes, let's say, one by four seconds in a case, it will be. It will still take less than that. We are not talking of minutes and hours and all those. We are talking of milliseconds. It, it takes so so less time to to pronounce a word to make a sentence. So when we when we use unstressed syllables, when these syllables are not stressed, it doesn't take as much time. It takes less time. It it gets reduced. The length of the sound is reduced, and therefore the vowels. And that we do that we achieve by weakening the vowels. So yesterday I was giving an example. Now also I'll give some more. In let's say in a word like some, s o m e some, in a in a strong word it would be some. I want some money, but we we can say in a in some cases in a weak 
if it's used as a weak uh, syllable or in the weak form, it becomes sum. So that sum looks sounds like sum. So uh, that that's how this length is reduced, and that we again achieve by uh, elision is one of the ways we do that. I'll, I'll give you a few examples of the weak forms of the, of the word. So let's say, uh, let's say the T-H-E. T-H-E, by the way, D is used in both ways. If it follows a vowel, if it's followed by a vowel, a word beginning with a vowel sound, it becomes the. Otherwise, it's the. So the, the tables and chairs, but the apples and, and bananas. So the, the vowel gives us a gives us a clue that it becomes the or the. But even there also, it becomes weaker. So uh, in order to reduce the length of that vowel sound there, it becomes, it, it's, it's something like, uh, something like, have you seen the door keys? Have you, instead of telling, have you seen the door keys? We say, have you seen the door key? The the you almost, almost, you uh, know, it takes half the time, uh, half of what, uh, what it would normally take. So that's how, the then uh, let's say something like them we, we give them the medicine we give instead of telling we gave them the medicine we say we give them the medicine so that them became becomes a part of the previous world and again it also saves some time or or something like uh, something like let's say your so is that is that your quote is that is that your quote we don't say that is that your quote? Is that your quote? That that you again, uh, again your also gets reduced. The length is reduced, and that's because of the weak form. Um, now, two two things are clear then. One, in order to add fluency to what we speak on any occasion, irrespective of the notwithstanding the occasion we are talking of. It's not a, it's not that we are only when we speak to a vice chancellor, only when we speak in a class. It's not that. For normal fluency, for normal speech also, fluency is an added advantage. And in order to get fluency, some of the features, some of the aspects, some of the uh, exercises are necessary. One of them is this silent, one of them, them is the uh, weak forms. Weak forms, if you and and the consonant clusters and all those. Now, weak weak forms, for instance, just now we saw that if if you weaken the vowel in the in the word that you are using, and most of the weak forms we use because they are in you know, unaccented, they are used in case of unaccented syllables. So those are some something like like all those uh, uh, articles, for instance, a and the all those determiners. Then pronouns maybe he, she, it, they, uh, all those. Then maybe uh, conjunctions and or but and all those. And and then uh, auxiliary verbs, helping verbs, is, am, are, was, where, we, would, shall, should, all those. There are 25 of them, by the way. Uh, so those auxiliary, in all these cases, we try to, uh, we, they, these take, these become, this take the weaker forms because the, we want to contract, save some time. We want to save some time. And this adds, this shortening of this length in these words, in these uh, pronouns and then helping words and articles and determiners and conjunctions and all those, they, they save some time and then they make it, they make it happen. So, and, and I, Told you again clearly that we are not talking of saving uh, uh, an, an hour or saving a minute. We are talking of saving maybe one by tenth part of a second. That might look a very small, tiny fraction of time. But then we in in speech, when we make a sentence, it takes less than less than two seconds, three seconds. When we make a sentence, unless it's very long. If we make a sentence, good morning, how are you? That will take less than less than three seconds. Now, if we are talking of something in about three seconds time, and therefore saving a, a quarter of a second also is important there. If you are talking of an hour, saving three minutes would be would be a, a big thing, would be a big deal. 
or five minutes would be a big deal. But we are not talking of minutes, we are talking of seconds. So two seconds, three seconds, so there if you are saving one and a half second, two seconds, five seconds, that itself is a big deal. And therefore, that's one part. Secondly, it adds fluency so that you, you sound uh, more fluent. Now, not that. Now, many, some people may have, uh, or um, some people consider or mix up fluency with fast speaking. Now, if you talk too fast, that's, that's not a sign of fluency. Fluency is we talk fast, relatively faster, not fast again, is also, also relative. We talk relatively faster, but not at the expense of diluting the meaning or, or losing out on the content. In order, in our attempt to speak fast, speak really quickly, if we eat out something, if we miss out on something which is important in terms of the, in terms of the information that somebody is looking out for, in terms of the content that it contains, then it, it doesn't become fluent. Fluency is we, we speak relatively faster, but at the same time, we do not lose, we do not uh, lose out on the content or the information. Fine. Now, when in our own mother tongues, in vernacular languages, in our mother tongues, when we speak something, anybody who is not familiar with our language will think that we are speaking really fast. But then, that's not. We are speaking, we speak at our own pace. Because for that person, he will put it against English, or he will put it against some other language, it looks like, it appears that our language is faster. It's quite fast. He, he spoke quite fast. And, and another, of course, another factor is because we have been using this language, this mother tongue since our birth, and therefore we have been using it for as old as we are. So if somebody is 50, for example, that person has been using this language, using that language for 50 long years. And, and if you keep using constantly, keep constantly using your language for 50 long years, it's bound to be bound to be fluent, it's bound to be bound to be um, fast, bound to be fast paced. But then we don't lose out on anything. We know that this is this information. If you are if you are giving somebody some information about a about a festival. Diwali or Holi or something. Now, the other person should at least get that information that yes, there is Holi tomorrow or on Monday. So two things are necessary. There are Holi and Monday he should get at least. Other things he may not, you may not be interested in. But at least those two information that when is the Holi he asks. So you should be able to tell the Holi is on Monday. So at least that Holi and Monday two things must be clear. Or, or similarly, what time is the flight to uh, Jamshedpur? So if, if you tell, uh, there's one at 4.25 a.m. and another at 7.40 p.m. Two pieces of information. The morning and evening. Don't mix up again. Because if, you if we don't tell the a.m. and p.m. or morning or evening, then he, he has to, let's say the flight is in the morning, 7.40, and you, you didn't tell the time, a.m. or p.m. or morning or evening, then that, that gentleman will end up at the airport without checking the time and he will waste his entire day or he will miss his meeting or deadline or whatever he had. So that's why when we say it has to be really clear. All right. Then another, another, another aspect that also helps shape our fluency, helps our English, spoken English, all of us, whatever English we speak, is the silent letters. Many, many sounds, many letters go silent when we speak or when we use. It's a, it's a pattern, that's a, that's a rule that we, we don't use them. That's because they are not necessary. So in a word like, let's say, resign, he resigned from the post. So G there is, is silent. Or I walk three kilometers a day. Walk, L is silent there. We don't say walk, walk. So L is silent there. Or, or uh, pneuma pneumatic, pneumonia. He is suffering from pneumonia. Pneumonia, again, P is silent there. We don't say uh, P pneumonia. So, or mnemonic, M is silent there. Uh, and and that's, uh, that, that's, a, that's a whole lot of things uh, which, which makes English sound good. So, learning or teaching pronunciation is not an easy task. 
as far as sonority is concerned, because there are there are lot lots of complicated things in the silent lettered words, in the in the uh, stressed and unstressed syllables, in the in pronouncing a particular sound in a particular way, uh, and but but then with a with a regular practice, with a with a with a serious attempt, all of us can. We can actually do. It. In fact, Indians, I, I told yesterday also, our English is far more superior to many others outside. We speak better English than many people outside. In in Africa, for instance, in in Europe, many parts of Europe, for instance, our English is is appreciated. Ours is one of the uh, closest to the. That's a benchmark. We call it a received pronunciation of England, RP. Uh, our English, the Indian English, GIE, we call it General Indian English, GIE. GIE is, is, is closest to the RP, received pronunciation of England. And that also, not every Englishman or woman speaks that. That also only in one part of London, in one corner of London, one English is used. That is the benchmark for English and anybody who tries to see how good or bad his, his or her English is, it has to be put against that. It has to be benchmarked against that and then tell, okay, if you clear this, if your English reaches somewhere here, approximates to this one up to this extent, then your English is considered right. That's why IELTS, TOEFL and all those, they, they test us. When, when our people go to go abroad for higher studies or jobs, in either case, general uh, IELTS general training is for jobs, and IELTS offers a an academic training, academic test that's for jobs, jobs uh, that's for uh, higher studies. So when people go there, go abroad to study, uh, most most of the U.S. universities, most of the universities in in Europe and Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and all those, they expect a 6.5 band in IELTS. Band score is zero from nine, but 6.5 they expect in all the four uh, skills, L, S, R, W. Listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Now their, their idea is that if somebody has got a fairly good score or good skill in these four uh, areas, listening, speaking, reading, and writing, he or she will be able to understand our culture, our language, and our communication. So that communication will not break down, and he or she can survive in our country. That's the primary goal. So if somebody goes to a university in, in Australia or Canada, if, if the proficiency level is very low, that person will struggle to understand the lectures in the class. And that professor has to struggle to make him or her understand the concept, which is why they say, okay, let's have some basic. Some cutoff, so 6.5 is the minimum for many universities. 6, 6.5 is the 6.5 in the overall band. 6 is the minimum in each. So they say, if you have got around 6, 6.5, we will, uh, you will qualify to join our university. Similarly, jobs also, because you are going to stay there or work there, you have got a work permit. Uh, you will get a work permit based on this. So they say that if your English is okay, in all the four areas, then you can manage here. So that's how that's how they they consider our English. Eng Indian English is, is okay. Many people from India go abroad every every year. Several people go abroad for higher studies or jobs and all those, and they have been doing good. And people in those countries in the in, in, uh, Europe, Asia, Europe, Africa, the U.S., Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and all those, they are very happy that our people can manage uh, to speak English well. And ours is much better than others' English. Okay. Now, silent letter, uh, letters. So one of the immediate factors is the lack of correspondence between the letters and the sounds. We don't have a have a one-on-one, uh, one-to-one -on -one, one relationship between sounds and letters. We have 26 letters in the English alphabet. As opposed to that, we have 44 sounds. And therefore, because of the discrepancy between sounds, between letters and sounds, sometimes it becomes really tough. But then once we, we notice them, once we put some effort to learn them, once we practice some, it, it becomes a, a cakewalk. And, and the, uh, of course, that 
disparity between sounds and between letters and sounds makes the uh, non-native speakers like like Indians and for whom English is not the mother tongue. It it makes our difficult uh, makes our job slightly difficult. But then we can always learn that. And then once we see the rules, once we understand the basics and the concept and start using them, it will no longer be a difficult proposition. Uh, a learner who expects to uh, letter who expects the letter B, for instance, in a in word like let's say bat or or robin or cab or baton, if he gets confronts a word like dumb or or tomb or doubt, there be doesn't appear at all. Now, how, how does one account for this? Initially, we see, okay, B is a clear sound. So it's, it's clear in a word like bat or or baton or, or, or barbecue. But then in a word like uh, tomb or doubt, it doesn't appear there. So now, now there's a pattern there. So we can, we can see a whole lot of words with, with, uh, with these uh, sounds with each of these letters being silent there, and that will give us a hint, that will give us a give us an exercise, and then uh, maybe equip us with the skill to to appreciate, and then using them at our uh, at our pace and at our way. So let's say for A, uh, A is silent in words like uh, bored or aesthetic. B is silent in words like doubt and tomb, or C is silent in words like jar and indict, the court indicted him. D is silent in words like Wednesday and handkerchief. We don't say handkerchief, we say handkerchief. So hanky, handkerchief. So they are, it's again, uh, it's something which is silent. Then F is, is U, E is silent in words like uh, I or eucalyptus. Or F is silent in words like halfpenny or, or uh, halfpenny. G is silent in paradigm, H in R or honest. Uh, J, I is, I is silent in parliament and business. J, J is silent in, in words uh, like, like uh, young, Carl Young, that uh, psychologist, Carl Young or marijuana. Marijuana is a, uh, is a drug, so marijuana. Or uh, J, K is silent in knowledge and, and, and a knife and no. And M is L, sorry. L is silent in Amons, Amons and, and half and walk. Then uh, M, M is silent in mnemonic. N is silent in him. Him is a prayer offered to God. So him, H Y M N, him. There N is silent. Uh, o is, is silent in words like Oedipus or uh, leper. Then P is silent in pneumatic or psychology. Then Q, Q in key or key. Then R in forecastle or smart. S in isle and island or viscount. T in, in again, castle and, and Christmas. Christ, we don't say Christmas. Christmas. Xmas, Christmas, 25th of December. So Christmas. T is silent there. Uh, U is silent in build and guess. Uh, v, v is silent in five, five pence. W is silent in a playwright or answer. Uh, X is silent in four pay and, and W or Xerox. Xerox. Uh, y is silent in U or prayer or Yugoslavia. And Z is silent in rendezvous or check. Now, these, these letters, when we know that, okay, they are silent in these cases, then uh, automatically that word is pronounced correctly. And if we get the word right, if we pronounce the word correctly, then that makes our speech much more easier and, and better. Coming to word stress. Word stress is the relative prominence given to a syllable in a word or a sentence, in a word or a, or a part thereof. A word may have two or three or four syllables. So one of the syllables gets the prominence, gets the stress, and that's called the stressed syllable. The others are unstressed syllables. And in order to, in, because of the stressed, stressed uh, syllables in a line, in a, in a sentence or in a connected speech, 
we get the rhythm, we get the beat at a regular interval of time. So it's a stress time syllable. In English, it's a stress time syllable. So every uh, stress level occurs at a re regular frequency in a line or a sentence or a or or a or a or maybe a part of a line and that that makes it that makes it uh, rhythmic so uh, twinkle twinkle little star how i will know what you are now there it's a, it's a rhythm because twinkle in the word in the first word twinkle we have the syllable we have the stress on the first sound twin so twinkle twinkle little star how i wonder what you are so four syllables there four stresses there second line also four that makes it ident uniform that makes it similar and so it it takes almost the same time the first line and the second time though though the number of words in the second line is more than it is in the first line in the first line we have four words twinkle twinkle little star four words in the in the second sound in the second line we have how i wonder what you are six words a number of syllables also similarly would be more but time takes time taken by both the lines one and two are uh, is exactly similar and that makes a rhythm now let's let's run through some word stress uh, first stress in the first syllable stress on the second syllable and all those in the word like let's say argument or judgment or or present those are accented in the first syllables Examples of words getting the accent on the second syllable is count. We don't say account. It's count, demand, or, or present. I presented him uh, with a with a shawl. So present. Or uh, third syllable again, academic. We don't say academic, academic, autocratic, or or immorality. Then fourth. Stress on the fourth syllable would be apologetic. He sounded apologetic. Or uh, there was a there was a negotiation. There was a negotiation. There was a negotiation. And then stress on the fifth syllable. The, the, that was fourth. First, second, third, fourth, now fifth. Uh, decolonization. Decolonization. De -co -lo -jation. So jation is the first fifth syllable. Then, then you have your responsibility. Now, ir, res, pun, si, be, liti. So, responsibility. Uh, and this is how we use the stress on the first or second or third, depending on the, depending on where the stress is put. And uh, that that makes the that adds fluency and correctness to our to the English we speak. Now, word stress. In, that was those were single words. Now, compound nouns, compound words, made up of two words, made up of two words, and function as one word. Something like air raid. In in uh, most compound words, the syllables, the the first element is accented. There are two elements at least because that's a compound word. Two words are there. The first element is accented. Uh, something like uh, let's say bookshelf. So there's a book and shelf. There are two words or two syllables, but the first element is accented in these compound words: bookshelf, bookshelf. Then school bus, raincoat. We don't say raincoat; we say raincoat. School bus, and then that's your that's the first syllable. Then the list of compound words with ever or self. The words must be ending in ever or self as a as a component, and there the the accent is on the on the ending of that ever or shall, something like herself, he herself, he, she herself did it, or whoever can come is welcome, whoever can come is welcome, or or they, they themselves are responsible for this uh, mess, this mess. The list of compound words where both elements are accented. There are some compound wor words where both are accented. Of course, when there are stresses on both the syllables, one is primary stress and the second one is secondary stress. But then we have both. So what happens there? Afternoon, good afternoon. We say good afternoon to everybody. Then he is a bad-tempered man. He is a bad-tempered person. 
or or uh, vice chancellor i i met the vice chancellor of a university so vice chancellor so there vice is is secondary stress vice has secondary stress chancellor has the primary stress so vice chancellor then derivatives those words which derive from the same root uh, they are the stress changes depending on the word so let's say academy academy indian academy of sciences so academy but when you use it as an adjective it changes the form it changes the stress position it becomes academic so academic and and, and from academic again if you evolve one more word you derive one more word academician so there the stress is on the me so academician academy academic academician similarly let's say politics politics political politician or or uh, economy okay economy economist economical or the biography the biographer the biographic so there again if you change the uh, form of the word from autobiography is is uh, a noun autobiography is adjective in the autobiography noun as a noun you say to biography in the adjective to biographic graphic it gets the accent in the second part some some words with weak prefixes like about uh, or about or ago they are weak prefixes so they are always accented on the root so about about nine o'clock or because because he was not interested he didn't come so not not we don't say because we say because because he was not interested he stayed away uh inflectional suffixes when we when inflections uh like adding of ed or past tense or or plural or third person singular es s or es so or ing in the present progressive form or gerund form when we use this ing es s or es or ed uh, all those those are inflections and what happens there let's say uh, something like uh, advance advance so that's a let's say verb advance and when you use it as a uh, as a noun as as a as a, let's say adjective advancing advancing years advancing age there it doesn't change so advance also you have the stress on the advance and in the in the advancing also it's on the advance or or commit and committing let's say commit don't commit yourself to doing this another is uh, they are not committing to do this so commit both the forms in both the forms the stress remains the same okay now derivation so when you derive one word from another like adding by adding a g e or uh, a n c e or e n or e s s or full or hood or ice and all those the words uh, normally do not change the stress pattern doesn't change they remain the same only exception is prince in the word prince prince of wales and princess it the stress is in the second part in the second uh, syllable ses so prince of wales and princess diana but in all other cases actor actress for instance or author authorship or uh, brother brotherhood there the image is the same brother also we have the accent in the first syllable brotherhood also it's in the first syllable it doesn't change then in verbs uh, nouns nouns or adjectives words used as nouns or adjectives they take the Uh, they are generally accented in the first syllable so absent he ab he is uh, adjective so he is absent today absent or addict he is an addict so they are again first syllable or conduct i i cannot write a conduct certificate for you so they are conduct but then if you write it write them as verbs use them as verbs so he absented himself from the meeting he was absent but he was he absented himself or uh addict and addict or he is addicted to to drugs or conduct and then conduct he he conducted the meeting smoothly so there 
because of the because they are used as verbs they take the accent in the second syllables if they are used as nouns or adjectives they take them in the first case okay all right uh all good now so so far so good yes sir and ma'am okay thank you okay good now accent and rhythm one of these syllables in in english we have two or more syllables because in polysyllabic words you, you can have many or in a sentence for example you will have so many words having so many syllables and therefore there are so many syllables in in english one of the syllables in a polysyllabic word receives the primary accent or the stress one of them receives the primary stress or the primary accent and others receive the the second one one of the other others receives the secondary stress so you have now one primary stress and the secondary primary stress is generally put in the put like a an apostrophe before the syllable uh, there's primary stress and secondary stress is the same kind of a vertical stroke is put below not above the word is below the word below the syllable before the syllable below and before so that that makes it uh, something like this i'll maybe i'll type it out one of them i'll type let's say okay uh rhythm so that's the primary stress and the secondary stress now rhythm is the regular periodic recurrence regular periodic occurrence or reoccurrence of certain patterns of sounds in utterances constituting a text in a text sounds occur at regular intervals of time in a line or a or a sentence and it's it's regular it's is consistent and uh, it's stress time because each stressed syllable takes almost the same time and in between the in between whatever unstressed syllables are there they they will take the same time in the next line also between two stressed syllables whatever is there will be contracted and they take almost the same time as in another line or another uh, another uh, part of the a part of a line also where it's even if it's smaller irrespective of the length of the unstressed syllables time taken is the same is the same which is why it's stress timed syllable stress timed okay uh, syllables occurring between one stress syllables syllable and the next time taken to move from one stress syllable to the next is generally in proportion to the number of unstressed syllables followed by unstressed syllables so rhythmic grouping correlates with a stressed syllable followed by unstressed syllable or syllables up to the next stress level but not including it excluding the stressed syllable whatever unstressed syllables are there that take almost the same time in the next line also that takes so uh, something like go and get me a cup of milk now there are four stress stress here go and get me a cup of milk go and get me a cup of milk in the next line we have something like sam bought a new bag sam bought a new bag so sam bought new bag there are four but words 1 2 3 4 5 here 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 2 plus 2 4 there are eight words in the first line first sentence go and get me a cup of milk there also we have four stress and in the second line there are only five words sam bought a new bag and there there are four sound four stress so four stress uh, stresses four words which are stress stressed that's how irrespective of the number of the words the stress remains the same so go and get me a cup of milk she bought a new bag or or that's that's nothing to be done this is the house that mac built time and tide waits for no man what's the name of the person up to your right who switched on the ac who switched on the ac there are two syllables switched and then ac who switched on the ac who we don't say who switched on the ac we don't say who switched on the ac 
and uh, the next is intonation the tone determines tone by the way also determines the mood what your relationship with the other person what is your uh, equation with the other person what you intend to say if you are angry or sad or happy or or, or good and and uh, whether you are ecstatic whether you respect that person whether you are insensitive or indifferent to that person so all those things can be guessed or can be known from the tone of your from the intonation of your uh, the intonation that you use in a sentence in a uh, so let's let's understand the basic first what is intonation and then we will see some examples to to understand <coughs> in in phonetics intonation refers to the melodic pattern of an utterance melodic so it adds melody to the to the utterance whatever sounds we utter whatever words we utter it adds melody to that it's, it's primary is primarily a matter of variation in the pitch level pitch level and voice so lower pitch high high pitch so it, it determines the pitch uh, variation in the pitch level of the voice but in english stress and rhythm are also involved not only because it doesn't work in isolation. Intonation does not work in isolation. It also has something to do with stress and rhythm. Stress and rhythm also has something to do with word stress or word accent. That again has has to do has something to do with the sounds, individual sounds and how they are accented, how they are pronounced. And this is how the whole thing is related. It's a symbiotic thing. All of them work in perfect harmony. We can't do we can't learn one unit in isolation or in exclusion to the others. All of them work in collaboration. If, if we want to learn to, if we learn to speak English, English well, it can't be done in isolation telling, sir, only intonation is okay. How, how if, what if I learn only intonation? No, sir, we cannot. Intonation, we can learn, we will learn only if we also are comfortable with, with uh, something like accent or rhythm. Accent and rhythm will be okay only if we learn the basics of stress, word stress. That stress again, we can, a learning of the stress will be better or using our stress will be much better only if we know how to pronounce each sound, differentiating between the vowels and the consonants and each sound. And also, and also those sounds, those sounds or individual consonants or vowel sounds or individual or stress or intonation and all those they're again dependent on silent words on consonant clusters on elision and all those factors so it's a holistic approach we cannot learn one thing at the cost of others it's like it's simple it's, it's as, as simple as this when we want to learn mathematics we can't say sir i want to do only i want to learn only addition i'm not worried about multiplication subtraction or or uh, algebra or mensuration and all those. We have to have all of them together so that our skills, geometry, we need to have geometry, we need to have algebra, we need to have arithmetic, we need to have sums, we need to learn learn the uh, pi and all the formulas, then only the entire, the, the whole branch of mathematics can be useful. We can't say no, I need only, um, only subtraction or only edit addition, multiplication, and all those things are not necessary. No, all of them are necessary and we need to learn all of them together. So it's a symbiotic thing. All of them must be done, must be learned together. So this way, intonation also, it happens that way. Now, uh, an example of, of intonation, say, uh, sorry, uh, it, it conveys differences of expressive meaning, say for example, surprise, anger, weariness, and all those. And it's the way the pitch of your voice goes up and down as you talk or recite something. If you sing something, if you recite something, if you say something, the manner in which you modulate your voice, you raise your pitch and then you fall your pitch, then that determines the tone, that determines all the feelings and the, and the manners. <clears throat> An example of intonation is the way your voice raises in pitch at the end of a question. When you ask a question, the voice rises. So we say, what's your name? We don't say, what's your name? We say, what's your name? So it rises. And say, they will, somebody will say, 
Yeah, my name is Pavitra. Okay, my name is Pavitra. So that's right. <laughs> there are four major international patterns in English. There are four major. Because there are a couple of others also which um, overlap. But generally we have four. Falling tone, rising tone, falling rising and rising falling. Falling tone is from high to low. So the pitch falls with time. It can be low fall and high fall like this. Rising tone is it rises. The pitch rises and it can be low rise. It can be low rise or it can be high rise. Then falling rising. So it, it falls and the rises like a V. And rising falling, it rises and then falls like A. Now falling, falling tone. In, in falling tone, falling tone, there are two things. Low fall and high fall. Low fall is like this slope. High fall will be like this, slant. In a, in a low fall, this is what, this is how we use in statements. When you make a statement, I think you arrived on Sunday. Something like very uninterested. Okay, I, I know, I know you arrived on Sunday. Very uninterested, you are not very serious, you are talking casually. So I think you arrived on Sunday. That's a statement there, you use a low fall tone like this. Or, or the postman was looking for you. Matter of fact, you are not really serious. You are not giving some exciting information. Say, uh, the postman was looking for you. So that's a bland information. So there again, low fall. It's like this. Or in WH questions, what can I do for you? You are not really serious, not really very uh, enthusiastic. And although you are just, just suggesting, oh, what can I do for you? So there are... It's like mechanically somebody is trained to ask you when you go to a hotel, when you go to a lobby, somebody will say, may I help you? Who may I help you? So that's a mechanical thing. Uh, there's no emotions involved. So that's unemotional. Uh, what can I do for you? Or, or when will he come? It's very, very casual, very weak uh, way of asking something. Uh, yes, no type question, like all the, all the questions, all the interrogative interrogations or interrogative questions. Uh, beginning with with helping verbs, they are yes no type questions, uh, that auxiliaries and all those. They are uh, we use something like something like do you do you think so? Do you think so? Now that's very that's a very uh, you know, Im impatient way of asking somebody. What do you what do you think? Do you think so? So or or is she coming tomorrow? Is she coming now? So you no know, involvement. I, I'm, I'm anyway not worried about that. I'm not bothered about that. But is she coming anyway? So that's that's again something that you are not showing your involvement. Or tag question. Tag questions are those questions we ask for reinforcement. So it a, it's a part of a question and also a part of a statement. And there because we we don't uh, we want somebody to uh, we want somebody to agree to what we say. So something like something like it's it's a lovely day, isn't it? You know it's a, a day is good for you. The day is lovely, so you are almost imposing him or her to tell to agree with you, telling, oh yeah, it's lovely. So it's a lovely day, isn't it? Or you did it, didn't you? You you told him that, didn't you? Now there again, you are not leaving an option, giving an option to him or her to escape. If you say, I you told him that, didn't you? So the other person. Can't even say that, no, no, I didn't say. He will have to say, oh, yeah, I had to. So that's tech questions. In tech questions also, we use a uh, falling tone, low fall tone. Then commands and requests, so like buy one, get one for me, or come and meet me at 10 o'clock tomorrow. Now that's a command. You don't have a choice. Or exclamations, good morning. It's a routine work. Or how surprising. That's a mild, a mild way of telling it's, it's not really surprising. So that's low fall. Then high fall will be like, like this, like sharp. So high fall uh, tone is used to convey emotions and feelings. Uh, say, for example, in something like, certainly not. Now that's a statement. Somebody said something and you say, no way. Now that's strong disagreement. So it's a sharp fall. Or, oh, yes, I did it. Who did that? Oh, yes, I did it. So that's again sharp form. Or in WH question, why did you go? That's almost like with anger. You are asking with anger. Why did you go? I asked you to come at 10. Why did you go? Or why can't you do this? 
I wanted you to do this now. Why can't you do this? Similarly, yesterday I questioned, can you come? Then the other person says, no, no, I have some problem. I, I, I have some work at home. Nothing doing. I don't want that. You have to come. So something like that. Or tech question, it's not possible to do. So is it? You are again giving a suggestion where the other person doesn't have much choice. Or in command, go away. So that's like a, in angry tone. In an angry tone, if you say something, that's again a sharp fall. Or exclamation, good morning. So very warm and hearty. Good morning. How are you? So that's really showing some keenness. Now talk of rising. That was fall, low fall and high fall. Now rising form, low rise and then high rise. So let's look at the low rise. So from slowly you rise this. Something like in statements you say, uh, yeah, it won't last long. So you are maybe reassuring, telling somebody will tell you some problem. You say, I know, I understand it's difficult, but then uh, you, it won't last long. So there you are rising it. It, it won't last long. Or in WH question, uh, where can you go? In somebody politely asking somebody, uh, where are you going? Something like this. Or in a uh, yesterday question, did you meet him? I had asked him to ask you to see him. Did you meet him? Or in tag questions, he didn't do it, did he? Did he? No. Then in commands, shut the door. Polite request. It's not a command. It's not that shut the door now. It's not that shut the door. So that's again low rise. Or another exclamation would be something like, best of luck, all the best. So there again, it's a low rise. Then uh, high rise will be like this, very, very sharp rise. Something like uh, with questions. Somebody will tell you some name and then you will say, uh, did you say John? So there you are really keen to understand. So did you say John? So that's very high. Or, or another can be, somebody will say, I saw a snake. You say, did you say snake? So there again, you are rising. Or, or somebody will ask you, or somebody offer you something. Tirupati Prasadam, for instance, you say, is it from Tirupati? So again, you are rising. Right, this is high rise. Then there are falling tone. We have two ways of falling tones. One is fall, falling and rising like V. Another is rising and falling like A, English A. Now, falling, rising, what, how, do, how do you do? In, in falling, rising, it indicates we fall and then rise. They, so the fall and rise indicates uh, that something is implied. We, we imply something, many things we, we don't say and maybe we imply. Now, that impli by implication, we mean something, we say something, we, we utter something and then feel that somebody is, somebody is actually uh, able to follow that. Somebody is able to follow that. And uh, something like, uh, do, you play, do you play tennis? Somebody will say, yeah, sometimes. Now that sometimes is a uh, falling, rising tone. You fall in the sometimes, sometimes. Or, or somebody will say, I saw you at the cinema. I saw you at the cinema. I saw you at the cinema. He, he had told that he was going to office you, or, or, or class. He said, I saw you at the cinema. I saw you at the cinema. Or the, the coffee was good. The coffee was good. So that's fall rise. The rise fall would be something like you rise and then fall. So something like, uh, are you sure this will go? Are you sure this will go? Or, but is, is, he, is it this picture? Is, is it this? Is it this picture? Or how interesting? How interesting? So that's a sarcastic way of telling, yeah, it's very interesting. So how interesting. That's again uh, another way of telling or using the tone to, to convey certain messages. Some of you, whether you're angry, whether you are, you are uh, sarcastic or you are polite or you are harsh, that, that tone also, somebody will be able to find out, somebody will be able to uh, identify the tone from this way you speak. He or she doesn't have to, you don't have to tell that, okay, guys, okay, friends, I am telling you in a harsh manner. You don't have to tell that. From the tone itself, somebody will understand. They will be able to follow that you are harsh or you are soft or you are polite or you are happy or you are disgusted. Or, in fact, the words also 
uh, uh, will help you understand the way. Because if you tell something like, how disgusting. Now there you are definitely not telling that it's a grateful thing. It's definitely a terrible thing. If you tell that how disgusting, you are talking of something, of an experience which is disgusting. So that itself was a clue. On top of that, you tell how disgusting. So that, that will give you an impression, a, a, a hint to the listener that you are not happy with the, with the uh, way he did something or he spoke something. All right. Uh, a couple of more, more quick things to, to fix the problems in case we have. Uh, now, one of our objectives in, in learning spoken English is to use it well. That's the first thing. That, okay, we must learn in order to use it. It's like learning, uh, learning to ride a bike, learning to drive a car. So we must, must use it. That's the first thing. That we must be able to use it properly or use it well. That's the first thing. Second thing is, if I succeed in using it well, if I use my spoken English well, if I speak English well, then my it will help me grow. So my personality will evolve. People will respect me. People will follow me, whatever I say. I will not miscommunicate or end up in wrong communication or miscommunication. My, my English will be, will be good. So that's the second thing. But then how to do that? Because fluency has been one of the dominant things. So how to speak fluently, how to improve fluently, <laughs> fluency, how, to, how can I uh, better my fluency? There are some small steps. One is smile and breathe. Because if you frown and then tell something, that itself put up, puts off the listener. So the person who you are speaking to face to face or on the video phone or on a, on a Zoom call, if you frown and, and then speak something, that itself puts off the conversation. So the other person will say, what, I am not interested in seeing his face. He's not, he doesn't even smile. So first is smile and breathe. So because, because much of this spoken English, much of these things that we speak, any language, not only English, any language you speak, whenever we speak something, breathing plays a dominant role. Because the air, air pressure has to come from, air has to come from the lungs all the way through the articulatory uh, organs and all those through up up to the lips and beyond that. And therefore, breathing is necessary. Second, listen to learn. If if somebody somebody is telling something, you are telling something, make it a point to always listen to the other person. Tell me, oh, okay, okay, please. Huh? Yeah, tell me. You wanted to tell something? Okay, great. Great. Please, go on. And then listen and then you can speak. So, that way, we, we need to cultivate one more skill also listening. That yes, we also must learn to listen. Three, don't imitate a native speaker all the time. Sometimes it's necessary. Like BBC, for instance, if you listen to the BBC, if you listen to the TED Talks, if you listen to the, to the video lectures or podcasts, they, they are native speakers. It may be British or it may be American, Americans. Native speakers speak something about a certain thing. So once you listen to them for a longer time, it our ears get tuned to the English that they use in terms of the fluency, in terms of accuracy, in terms of pronunciation, in terms of accent, in terms of accent and rhythm, in terms of intonation, all those things. So we listen to if you the more you listen to somebody, especially YouTube videos, because we also see. Or, or, or on television, BBC is one of them. If you listen to them, if you watch them, then our ears get tuned to the English. And the more we get tuned to that, the better exposure we get and the better becomes our English. Fourth, don't study too much of grammar. It's okay, grammar is necessary, it's a basic thing, but then not too much of that. It's okay, basic rules of grammar. That okay, a sentence in English begins with a capital letter, Statement ends with a full stop. An interrogative sentence ends with a question mark. That's a subject verb agreement. Subject has to agree with the verb. In the third person singular, if the number is a subject, number of the subject is, is singular and person is third. And if the verb is present tense, it takes S or ES. 
So those are basic rules. You don't have to read too much into grammar. It's okay to make mistakes. Don't don't worry about oh my my English will go wrong. People will laugh at my English. I I won't succeed. I don't know how my English will be. Don't don't have to worry about that. It's okay. We are. It's not our mother tongue. We understand. Everybody understands our own own uh, difficulties and 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 constraints. So that's that's not going to hurt us. Don't procrastinate. Okay, I'll I'll start from Makar Sankranti. Uh, I will. I will start from a uh, from Thursday. It's not that. Let right now. Whatever we want to do. If I want to speak English now, I will. I'll start speaking from today. Whenever any opportunity arises, I will pitch in. I will speak. I will listen to tapes, video, audio tapes, linked uh, YouTube videos, and all those. Listen to TED talk, TED talks and follow them. So that's it. Read the text aloud. Whenever we read something, read it aloud so that we know. How we pronounce those words? How how fast we are speaking? How how loudly or slowly we are speaking? And all those we get it ourselves, and then that becomes a part of our uh, that that becomes a, a self analysis. Okay, okay. When I read something aloud, I I'm not comfortable. I I talk it too too fast or too slow, or I don't uh, pronounce words correctly, or I, I don't stop at at uh, terminal points. So once you realize that, then you can fix your own problems. Right? Okay. Any anything else? Uh, yes. Yes, sirs. I I am done. In case you have any specific thing to ask or discuss, we can always do that. Please. Thank you, everybody, for uh, listening to me all these hours, one and a half hours yesterday and one and a half hours now. Uh, I I put in uh, my best to to disseminate as much information as I as it was possible and as was as as much as was necessary. Uh, it's not a it's not it was not meant to be or it's not meant to be a, a, a diploma or a, a or a PG course, and therefore we had to limit our our materials and resources also, and uh, keep keep it minimum. Only uh, the only purpose, the only uh, thing that we we thought of uh, giving is to is to make you feel comfortable with English. Is to is to is not not get uh, uh, held up by uh, English or skills and all those. All of us can do. All of us have been doing. In fact, I, I believe from the profiles that I see, all of us have been doing English uh, in, in whatever way we do. Only thing uh, that we attempted uh, to to uh, give some inputs to fix if at all there are some problems and to to learn and then uh, bank on uh, the materials and the resources that that we can have, and uh, that's how. Uh, we can improve on because there is always a scope for improvement. So we we must keep learning. We must keep doing, and and whenever whatever uh, forum we we get, three four things. First thing is, uh, at, at the earliest opportunity, whenever we get uh, a, a forum or get an opportunity, we must be the first to open up. So yes, sir, I want to speak. I want to start. So that's it. Must start from there. Second, second thing is, we must not be pulled back by somebody telling, "Oh no, no, I'm scared. My English may go wrong. People may laugh at me. I, I don't know why, how my English would be. I am not okay with English. No way. All of us are equally good. There's nothing, there's, there's nothing that uh, can can uh, stop us from learning or using English. All of us are users of English, either as second users or second language or foreign language." All of us are second users for India. For Indians, it's a it's a good thing that India English is an associate official language, almost almost like the official language Hindi. So because of that associate official language status, it's a, it's a common language spread uh, used officially across the spectrum, and therefore that makes our job much more easier. And number three, whenever we get an opportunity to learn from whatever source, it it can be uh, listening to the 
radio radios or, or or the audio tapes or the TED talks or the BBC news or listening to something that we are interested in. It's not necessary that only BBC is the best one. Any anyone who speaks English, Shashi Tharoor's English is good, or or uh, Apple CEO uh, Steve Jobs uh, had given a beautiful lecture on at uh, Stanford University commencement lecture. That's an amazing lecture. So we can listen to listen to commencement lectures. We can listen to convocation addresses. We can listen to TED talks. So many people uh, uh, keep keep talking about many many things. So that will give us uh, a, a proper training. And in case there are any loopholes or any gaps, those things will also help fix the gap. And then we can we have always the material with us, reference. And and these days, the, the whole whole world is available at our fingertip. So we can we can always yeah Obama is a good speaker yes sir so we can always uh, make use of the resources and and uh, definitely it's going to be a, a, an exciting journey thank you. Uh,